Um, I'd like to make a motion to file this item. Is Thank there a you. Second? Oh, can I have a second? President Yee. Thank you very much. Take that without objection. And Madam Clerk, can you please call item number two? Item number two is the hearing on the fiscal year 2017-2018 annual overtime report and the related structural budget impact for the five city departments with the highest overtime use. Thank you very much. And I believe we have the controller's office here today. Thank you. Still working, it won't open. I apologize, the file is there, but it's just not opening. Um, okay, I will switch to the overhead. Um, can I get my own copy? Uh, hi, Supervisors. My uh, name is Michael Mitten, and I'm from the Controller's Office, here to talk for a few minutes about the annual overtime report. Uh, I'll say up front that I'm here to talk about some general trends that's happening around the city, but if you want any detailed questions from departments, those should be directed to the various people sitting behind me. Um, so first, with the annual overtime report, we have three main goals. The first is to look at citywide overtime and both the hours and the expenditures. Second, the admin code asks us to look at the five departments with the highest overtime use each year. And that is uh, MTA, fire department, police department, sheriff's department, and DPH. And last, we look at measures in the admin code that we check whether departments are adhering to uh, overtime restrictions um, there, and we'll get to that at the end. So citywide in, the, in fiscal year 17-18, hours were up, overtime hours were up 5.4%, expenditures up 13%. Uh, you generally will see expenditures increase faster than overtime hours because wages are also rising. And we see a general increase starting back at the Great Recession in 09-010. We see this general increase uh, throughout this time period on the slide. That actually is pretty consistent with overtime share of spending as the total budget. It's about Overtime spending is about 2% of the total budget, and it's remained right around there over this entire time period. This is just a list of the top, depart the top departments for overtime use in 1718, and the five that are at the top are, there's a clear break between them and everybody else. Uh, airport, PC, DEM, Public Works are always there in that four to five, six range. And then there's a set that's in the one to two range. Uh, admin services got, the, got to make the top 10 this year. Now, one of the important things about 
over time is that it isn't really a fiscal issue because it doesn't cost more than hiring an additional person to take care of those hours. And the reason here is that if you hire an additional person right out of the gate, you have to pay them two or three weeks of vacation, 12 days of holidays, sick time, and health insurance, and every one of their hours worked accrues retirement costs, which right now is about 20%. But with overtime, each hour spent in overtime, the only additional cost the city faces is just the federal payroll taxes of Social Security and uh, Medicare. So because of that imbalance, it's actually about the same to hire, to, to use overtime rather than hire new workers. Uh, in addition, some of the overtime hours are actually paid at straight time, the not time and a half. Uh, where you typically see this happen is in places where they work regular schedules but are non-standard. In particular, the fire department, uh, where the fire depart firefighters do not work at the standard eight-hour days. Uh, about 27% of the overtime hours in the fire department are paid at straight time. Similarly, at DPH, nurses don't work standard schedules. They work 10 and 12 a lot. And uh, the way it works out is about 20% of the hours at DPH are actually straight time overtime. And the way this basically works is if a nurse works 12 hours, the, the, the time and a half for a nurse is based on how much they do over a week, a week or two weeks, I can't remember. It's not how much they do in a day. So when they work 12 hours in one day, there's eight hours of regular time, and then there's four hours of straight time overtime. Because payroll, we don't log more than eight hours of regular time in a day. Um, so again, because overtime is not necessarily more expensive, departments can use it as one of their tools to manage the budget. Similar to uh, overtime is comp time. Comp time is where you work and instead of giving, getting a payout of time and a half, you get comp time in return. And this year, comp time increased 9.1%, which uh, is about double the rate of increase in overtime hours. Um, comp time is not part, is not budgeted, but that doesn't mean it doesn't come with costs. First, in many situations, if we work an extra hour and then we get an hour and a half off, there's a, there's a loss of productivity there. There's an additional half hour that, you know, work is not being done. Again, that doesn't sit anywhere in the budget, but that is still a cost. The other is that in some uh, job classes where there are fixed staffing levels, when somebody opts for comp time, when they use that comp time, that will generate additional overtime. And the example on the slide here is somebody works an extra hour, and instead of just getting an hour and a half of wages, they opt for an hour and a half of time. And when they use that hour and a half of time, that's going to have to be backfilled by somebody else. Oh, thank you. That's going to have to be backfilled by somebody else at the cost of two and a quarter hours worth of wages. So what could have been a one and a half hour wage cost turned into a two and a quarter hour wage cost because of comp time. I'm going to turn now to just a few comments about individual departments. Um, MTA had 10 hour increase, increase of 10% in its hours in 1718. They reported that the primary drivers here were uh, a shorter of transit operators and increased demands relative to for special events and construction. Um, we'll also note that MTA is one department that uses a lot of scheduled overtime because the length of time that bus routes are open or the length of time it takes for a bus to do a complete circuit, it doesn't fit into a standard eight hour schedule. So they use overtime to fill these out rather than bringing in other people for short periods of time. The fire department also was down, was down in hours and expenditures this year. You can see in 2015-16 that they had a bump up. That's when they opened a new fire station, and they did not have the staffing yet to accommodate that. But in the next two years, they've increased their staffing, and, the, and their overtime has come down. It's an interesting slide here to look at their FTEs. 
they follow a pretty general pattern of when the FTEs fall, the overtime increases, and when the FT FTEs come back up, the overtime falls. This is not something you would see in, for example, the police department, where they do not backfill any absences. You will not see the same sort of inverse correlation between FTEs and overtime. Police hours were up 13% this year, and uh, it's always worth noting with police that a third of their overtime this past year was so-called 10B. This is where they're being paid by outside entities to uh, cover events or, you know, security at any, any particular event that where a private party needs additional support. Those are not a cost to the city. Those are fully paid for by uh, these private parties and almost 10% of their overtime is funded through work orders with other departments. The Sheriff's Department has had increasing overtime, significantly over, over increasing overtime for a few years now, but in 1718, they were able to fully staff, uh, almost fully staff what they intended, and you can see that the overtime leveled off at that point. They have had increases, increased responsibilities over these past years, and it took a while for the staffing to sort of catch up, I suppose. Um, Sheriff Department is one where we also have to point out that they have very skewed distribution of overtime. We have the top 5% of overtime earners earned 22% of the total overtime. So. That's an issue that whether that's fair or whether that's, you know, whether they can continue to do their job with so much, uh, with so much overtime. But at the same time, people willing to do that much overtime means that other people don't have to, have to work mandatory overtime. DPH, the last of the five departments, um, has also seen steady increases over the last few years. I think more interesting is to break it down by hospital you can see in the yellow there is uh, Zuckerberg San Francisco General, where as the new hospital was coming online and becoming uh, fully operational, their overtime increased quite a bit. But when it got to, when it what did become, when it was operational, it stayed level at that point. Laguna Honda, on the other hand, in the past year or two, they've had increasing staffing shortages and they've also had increasing needs for one-on-one -on -one care. And so you've seen the uh, ex increased expense for Laguna Honda there. And my last slide is maximum allowed overtime. The admin code says that nobody can work more than 25% of their regular hours as overtime unless the department requests an exemption from uh, Department of Human Resources. And this table shows that there were a total of 17 departments who had at least one employee that exceeded this 25% limit. Only four requested exemptions from DHR, and those are emergency management, juvenile probation, police, and airport. Uh, even in those situations, they did not, the exemptions did not fully cover everybody who exceeded the 25% limit. Um, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Um, any comments from my colleagues around this overtime report from the Controller's Department mm -hmm. or any questions for departments? Being none, I actually have some questions. Um, so when I see that um, some of the overtime I know that are in our departments are mandatory, is that correct? That there is always a certain amount of required overtime? Uh, I believe so. So would you say then every of the de these departments, MTA, fire, police, sheriffs, and public health, there's a certain amount of mandatory overtime that is required? I don't know. I, I would have to defer to the departments on whether it's mandatory or I can say there's some level of overtime which they generally expect because they use that in their budgeting practices. So when you say that it's not really, um, it's actually less expensive to use over time, are we also measuring about productivity on, uh, for example, did you tell me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that no one can work a maximum of over eight hours of overtime a day? Is that, did you say that? I'm sorry, I might have gotten no, it No, the payroll system 
um, after eight hours, it calls it overtime, even if it's still being registered, even if it's still straight time. So um, do we have a maximum on a number of overtime hours somebody can work on a given day? On a day, no, but there is a limit per week of 72 hours per week. And that is for people who normally work a 40 week hour, is that correct? Uh, true, that is for everybody except the fire department. They're exempted from that rule. So it means that an individual could actually work 72 hours in one week? Yes. And could that individual work the next week 72 hours in that next week? Yes. And could that individual then work a third week of 72 hours a week? Yes. And then a fourth week? Yes, at some point they'll reach the 25% cap and then they're supposed to stop. And there is, are there exceptions to the 25% cap? Uh, if they get exemptions from DHR, that exempts them. And do we have the numbers and of emergencies, exemptions? And uh, emergencies, things like that are also exempted. Do we have any data from DHR, I'm sorry if you presented it, of how many individuals um, was exempt, were exempted from the 25% cap? Yes, it's a... Uh, I'm so sorry. Last slide, last real slide. There were a total of 1,117 employees who exceeded the 25% limit. And that's total city employees. Total city employees. And of all of those, 67 were exempted by DHR um, to exceed this, the 25% limit. So there were... 1,117 employees that exceeded the 25% cap. Yes. And of those, 6%? 67. 67 individuals? Yes. 67 percent. individuals received exemptions. The exemptions are usually done, sometimes a department will ask for exemptions for specific individuals. Sometimes they'll ask for exemptions for an entire class. It depends on whatever their needs are at the time. Um, but yes. So do we, as a city and county, um, have an ideal amount or a target amount of overtime that we think is healthy and sustainable? As far as I'm aware, I, I, am not, I am not aware of any such study for optimal overtime levels. So we see that um, it just increases by 10%, 13%. Um, but we have no way to judge or measure whether or not that is within an acceptable amount of overtime. So if next year it's 20%, 29%. Uh, again, from a budget perspective, uh, it's not really a budget issue, but it is issues in other ways for equity and health of our employees. Um, I believe the 25% cap is there to protect employees. Um, so it is, these are important issues, but they're not budget issues that uh, we in the controller's office are typically handling. Okay, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Any questions? Yes, Supervisor Mandelman. Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's stri it, seems like, it seems quite odd that, that we, the city would be relying on overtime to the extent that it seems to be without departments requesting those exemptions. You probably have nothing to say about that. Any I, reason we shouldn't be a little worried as I San do Francisco not, civic leaders about this? I can't speak to why departments have not asked. Um, I haven't talked to anybody who hasn't asked about that. Uh, okay. Do you think they know? Well, that's what I was hesitating. Yeah. You know, it's entirely possible they don't. Um, it's a small part of the admin code. It's an important part, but it is there. <laughs> Mr. Controller. I was just gonna very briefly comment here that of course that our office's role in this report is a, a compliance reporting one. So here, the, the board adopted these rules um, and created an exemption process that involved DHR we don't play a role in administering this process. We're simply reporting on non-compliance with it, which is significant, as you've noted, and has been consistently significant over many years of these reports. Um, if this is something that is, um, is important to the board, I would suggest following up with departments in the Department of Human Resources, but I do believe that this is an understood exemption process that 
has been included in this report for many years. For many years. It's not like a new thing. This is not a, a new issue that we're highlighting in this but, annual but this, report. But this requirement to get the exemption is... Correct. Yeah. Interesting. Sorry, one detail I should mention. MTA has their own, uses their own human resources department to establish the exemption. Uh, they're supposed to notify the controller's office. We did not hear from them. I also requested information on whether they had done an exemption and did not hear back. That's great, because we have MTA here today. Yes. So maybe we should ask the MTA that question. Thank you very much. Is MTA here? Um, so seeing that you've had a 10.5 increase in overtime hours, and we are not taking into account the 18, um, the, um, this year, actually, this current year, um, what is your response to whether or not the 25% cap exemption has been granted to individuals? And do you, first, do you have any employees that have exceeded the 25% cap? and then I think you're supposed to register it or let the controller's office know and they have not heard from you, so is there a response? Good afternoon, uh, Supervisor Fuhrer. Um, my name is Derek Kim, I'm, with the, I'm the Acting uh, Human Resource Director for SFMTA. Uh, yes, I realize, uh, I see that on the report that uh, we did not respond or have a figure for the employee exemption. I, I know that that has been done in the past, at this moment that um, I do not know why this uh, exemption wasn't done um, for fiscal year 17, 18. I will go back and find out as to what happened. I do know that uh, the current, the brand new CFO, the 11th and a half, made it one of his top priorities to ensure and look at our current overtime figures as well as the overtime exemption report. But at this time, I do not know why uh, we did not report uh, those numbers. Could you tell me what the average overtime for Muni drivers are? Is unfortunately, I don't have that total with me right now. Um, I, uh, like what the analyst alluded to, the uh, the Muni drive, the transit operators have uh, both a scheduled as well as an unscheduled overtime. Uh, the scheduled overtime is built into their actual run schedule for uh, scheduling efficiencies as some of the reasons uh, that the analyst mentioned. Um, so I, I don't have that total figure, but I can certainly provide that for you also. So there is a certain amount of mandatory overtime that's included? Correct, not only with the transit operators, but also with um, uh, other job classifications, PCOs, as well as um, some of the uh, service critical job classifications at SFMTA. But your 10.5 increase in overtime hours isn't just for this scheduled overtime, is that correct? Correct. Uh, my understanding is that it encompasses both the scheduled as well as the unscheduled overtime. Uh, some of the things that, uh, in, pre in preparation for coming for this hearing, I uh, spoken with uh, some of the subject matter experts at SFMTA. Uh, you know, they alluded to some of the fact, as uh, I believe uh, has been in the press about our, uh, some of the new vehicles coming online. Uh, we had a facility that opened up uh, prior to the full staffing coming in in the following fiscal year, fiscal year 19. So some of those gaps were addressed through um, uh, overtime by, uh, by the existing staff. Do you have any drivers that are working 72 hours a week? Uh, no, the drivers actually, there's another, um, I'm afraid I don't know the numbers, but there is a, I want to say, an FTA guideline that pro uh, prohibits the total number of driving hours. So they are actually capped um, uh, do you know, beyond you, a certain number of hours. Do you know what that cap is? I apologize. I will, need to, uh, I will provide that answer for you. But uh, previously, because I have seen the uh, overtime exemption report before, and drivers are not one of the, um, the top number of people because of price precisely because of the capping this oh. gentleman have the answer oh i'm sorry so uh i've been just informed that the dot uh guideline says that they could only drive 12 hours in a day so they would never go beyond 12 hours so could they work then 12 hours on monday 12 hours on tuesday 12 hours on wednesday 12 hours on thursday i mean at some time fatigue has to set in i mean Driving, I mean, I think that even though this might not be um, a budgetary concern, 
I do think it is a human resource concern. I do think that if you're driving a muni bus consistently 12 hours a day for multiple days that and for um, a, a long period of time, I mean, that seems like it must take a toll on you, quite frankly. I would wholeheartedly agree, and that's why um, one of our, obviously our main priority have been to increase the transit operator hires, and we have seen some really good turnaround in the last three training classification, uh, la last three training classes to uh, increase our uh, dry, uh, transit operators. Okay, thank you. Any questions for MTA, anyone? Uh, not MTA, but the uh, police department. Police department, okay. Thank you. Um, is there some, thank you very much, Mr. Lee. Is someone from the police department here? President Yee. Thank you. I'm, I'm Carolyn Welch from the police department. Hi, Karen. Um, the, in regards to the overtime that's paid outside of the department, um, what are the policies around that? I mean, who, who, who are some of the, is it other departments that pay for it? Or um, is it um, private uh, parties and they want uniform cops there? So the, the, the 10B admin code is non-government entities who want to uh, ask the police chief for police security. So one of our largest clients is the Giants. Any event at Oracle Park, um, the Giants games or any concerts they have. Um, uh, the Tempe Admin Code also says any athletic events. So the Beta Breakers event that's happening this Sunday, the private party sponsor has to pay for the police officers to work that event. Same with uh, Nike Women's Marathon, um, other athletic events. Um, then we get into any filming events, anything that requires a street closure. Um, they have to uh, hire police officers through the 10B program. Um, they have to pay 14.7 administrative fee, which covers our scheduling and our payroll uh, accounting billing and processing payroll costs. And that 14.7 goes into the general fund as a revenue to offset those, uh, those costs. So let's say um, also entity like Giants, um, is it required that whatever they wanted the police department staff to do, that it would have to come from the police department? I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not sure if they're required or if they could go to a private security agency. Um, and then is there any policy uh, within the department to limit uh, how many hours of these outside um, uh, staffing that they may need? So, uh, so in other words, if, if a police officer, let's say, um, really wanted to do another eight-hour shift every day and because there's all this good money out there, um, do you allow for that? So the police department's internal policies are a little stricter than the city's. No one can work more than 14 hours uh, collectively, on duty and overtime to combined in a 24-hour period. And no one can work more than 40 hours a pay period of overtime or 20 hours a week. Um, so that's less than the city one. Regardless of any time, whether it's 10B, whether it's comp time accrual or whether it's paid overtime. Um, I will point out that the 10B time is exempted from the 520, we call it the 520 hours cap, not the 25% time, because that's how officers know to, to track if they're going to hit the 520 hours. Um, but the 10B time is exempted from that. So our department tracking is um, 1,040 hours in an annual year keeps them under the 20 hour per week um, of, uh, of overtime. Okay, you, you throw out a couple of numbers in there. So, I, um, so regardless of whether it's overtime within the department or if it's paid by the giants, that um, it's limited to 20 hours. Correct, a week. A week. 
and do you do you know if we have a lot of officers that m pretty much maxes out for the year? Uh, no, we don't. We track it on a biweekly, um, so everybody is sent out reports whether they exceeded the 14 hour per day or the 40 hour per week. Um, and the controller issues on a biweekly basis the 520 hour tracking report. Um, and so every year I've been with the police department, seven and a half years, we have always had a few violators like between two and 14. And often it's because an officer retired in the middle of the year and their overtime was above the 25%. Again, we're tracking on hours, um, not, real, not realizing their regular hours didn't hit the 2080 because they left. Um, we asked for one exemption uh, in 2011 for a homicide detective. And then last year was the first time we've asked for exemptions, and that was related to the airport needing um, extra officers and the airport officers extra uniform time. The airport officers are certified, so we could not send over officers from the city to cover that added service that the airport was requesting. I guess so I have maybe I have some concerns. If you do over a short period, let's say a few weeks of 20 hours a week over time, it might not be as impactful, but if you do it week after week after week, um, I guess that's what I'm getting at is, you know, if you're doing this for the whole year where it's, you're almost maxing out with 20 hours every week, I would, I would think that has, that would have some impact into one's ability to actually make, make good judgment. I agree. So, so, so I guess my question is, if we don't have any policies around that, uh, we should probably develop some policies around that and track it. Uh, unless I'm, I'm mistaken, I, I'm not an expert in terms of fatigue factors, but, but um, I know when when I was working as an ED, I, I would put in a lot of hours, and after a couple of months, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm not able to, to do my work as well as I should have. And I guess who would be, who would determine uh, that we need to develop this policy within the department? Um, well, like I said, the police already has a stricter uh, cap than the city. So it's probably a broader DHR and, and the chief discussion. Um, a, a lot of officers are working a 410, so that means they work four days a week for 10 hours. That means they have three days off. So if they're coming in for one or two more days to work a full shift, they're still getting you know, a full day off. But again, we probably have less than 20 people who show up on the max at the end of the year that have worked that level. Okay. Um, is anybody from HR here? No? I guess that's the question I, I want to ask is what in, impact it would have and whether we need to create some policies around. Because again, I, I get it, you know, that maybe a few weeks of it, uh, the impact might be less. But if you're doing this over and over and over again, I, 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 I have some concerns. That's all. Thank you. Um, we see that your chart says that um, your overtime hours are up by 13%. Do you know what percentage of your, um, of your overtime hours total are, I mean, of your working hours, um, how much, what percentage the overtime hours make up? I didn't hear that. Like if for either it's, so I'm trying to figure out, is it really um, all the hours that the police department works, what percentage of those hours are actually overtime oh. hours? Um, I did this, I'm, I believe, I'll have to, to verify, I believe the, 
the discretionary general fund over time is less than 5% of base pay salary in terms of dollars. But most of our overtime is not general fund discretionary. It's people requesting services or getting specific grants to do like DUI checkpoints um, right. or other operations. And so um, the city and county of San Francisco is reimbursed for those hours, like from the Giants oh, or yes. from Beta Breakers. Yes. So they get an reimbursement rate. And is there, is it um, the reimbursement rate, there's a 14.7% administrative fee on top of what the overtime hours are costing? Correct. Okay. And everyone pays that. The Giants pay it. Everyone pays it. Correct. Okay, and so how much would you say then that the city, the city seems as though then, uh, Mr. Controller maybe can answer this question, the city seems then to benefit from these overtime hours. Would that be a correct assumption? Financially. Um, in the case of the 10B, I'd really to defer to department. I think the administrative charge that's charged on 10B is an effort to recover the cost of administering the program, including some department-wide overhead, but um, should not be established as a fee that exceeds the actual cost of service. So it's sort of flat, you're saying? I, as a matter of fee setting and legal fee setting, it should by practice recover the cost of the service and not exceed it. Okay. If, if it were to, it would be a tax. So when we see this 12.9% increase in overtime hours for the police department, you're, are you saying to me it's because they've been attending a lot of parties? Um, I, uh, or events, um, sorry. I, or, well, yeah. So Sorry. we did, so if you're referring to in the report the increase from 1617 to 1718, um, we did have 23,000 hours in growth in the 10B. Um, so what we have done is we have added more staff to assist with some of the scheduling when we have more things going on. Um, so how does this coincide with actually enough police coverage? So we see an increase of all these numbers of police officers who are sworn police officers, actually people hiring their services um, in their police capacity, but yet we're seeing a shortage of police officers on the street. Yeah. How do you coincide this? I mean, what takes preference? So it, the, the only way we can provide these services is on overtime. Nobody gets any on-duty officer time because that's for the city's work. So the only way we can do work order services for other departments, we can do any grant funding operations, or we can do any 10B is on overtime. So, so it it's always on officers' days off. Is that correct? Or their shift off, yes. Their shift off. So it's never an officer taking vacation time or comp time or there, there, are, that. there are restrictions on their ability. So I believe they can use a vacation day and work 10B the same week, but they can't take a sick day, for example. So we do have restrictions on that. Okay. So the increase in overtime that we're seeing this, this last fiscal year, and again, this is not this fiscal year be, because we don't have the numbers for 1819, um, is the increase is because it's funded by private, I only said party because on here it says private party request, but it's not really going to parties, it's a private party that's requesting it. Is that correct? Would you say that your increase in overtime is due to this? So the, the report also, um, we had uh, 14,000 hours in response to the North Bay Fire Mutual Aid. That was an increase from 1617 to 1718. Um, and that hit the general fund, and then the city was reimbursed through the FEMA claim after the fiscal year closed. So 14,000 hours was part of the contribution to the increase from the prior year. That was because of the fire? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? What happens when you get it reimbursed um, with, the, with the funding? Does it go back into general funds? 
for mutual aid because the expense often incurs in one year and the reimbursement comes in the, f in the subsequent year. Typically, a department will consume its general fund budget in the year in which the mutual aid is responded, and the reimbursement just flows back and closes to the general fund in the, in the subsequent year when the reimbursement is received. General funds for the department? Uh, to the department and then closes out to the general fund as a whole, which is then the balance that you appropriate in the subsequent year budget. Okay, thank you. And then there is a certain amount of mandatory overtime in the police department, isn't there? The only mandatory overtime I would say is uh, two types. If an officer is responding to a call or processing an arrest and their shift ends, they have to continue to process what they're doing. Um, and then we have about 20 days of the year that are special event days, New Year's Eve, Halloween, Fourth of July, Chinese New Year. Uh, there are about 20 of them that we don't allow anybody to take time off. And we're allowed to change their start shift by seven hours. And we ask them to work a 12 or 14 hour day instead of their eight or 10 hour day. So those are the only two examples that it's really mandatory. That you would work overtime. And um, would if watches off or canceled? Those are those 20 days of the year where we issue them at the beginning of the calendar year so everybody knows. Okay, because sometimes during the year you do have emergencies where yeah. watches off or canceled. Yeah. And so that's a mandatory overtime, is that correct? Well, watches off canceled, I think, is you can't take time off. If you were scheduled to take vacation, um, we cancel trainings at the academy, for example. But it's um, not shifts? Um, I'm not 100% sure. You, you may know more than I do. I've had a lot of watches off, canceled, and vacations, yeah, and days off. So also I wanted to know, isn't a subpoena to court mandatory overtime? Yeah, that is a big, we had 19 million in expenditures last year. We spent almost 4 million in court pay. So that is a big chunk of our discretionary overtime, and it's not something that we can really control or reduce. Are we doing any analysis over that court overtime? For example, how many court cases are we actually winning? Um, because I know that you have to re the city has to reimburse for those tickets when we lose those tickets. And so just sort of wondering, have we done any sort of data analysis on um, how many of those court cases that we're prevailing in? Um, because it seems as though we would be paying overtime, I think that's four hours mandatory pay. The court, court pay is exempted from the four hour. From the four hour. Yeah, it's not a, it's not a minimum four hour. It's, it averages two. Two hours. Yeah. And then we also have to pay the tickets back if we, that have been issued, right? So have we ever done a cost analysis on that? Considering that um, we are hearing from the police department that it is a big chunk of their overtime dollars. I can't remember a specific audit or report, but I know that over the years this has been a subject of discussion between the mayor's office, the board, the police department, the DA, the public defender, and our shop to try different things. I don't know that we've figured out anything that has truly been successful. Ultimately, this cost, as I understand it, is driven at the police department, which incurs the expense, but it's fundamentally driven by choices made at both the public defender and DA's office. Um, and we've tried things over the years without an ability to curtail it. I could dust up on my knowledge of those past events and loop back to you, Chair Fewer, thank you. Uh, for further discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, I see that the fire department has had a decrease in overtime hours, and whereas the police overtime hours were increased because of fire, um, the fire department has had a decrease. So maybe you could respond to that. Hello, Elaine Walters, CFO with the Fire Department. Uh, yes, as we um, have increased, thanks to the uh, board and the mayor, our staffing through academies in recent years, we have a, a fixed number of slots we staff every day. So we try and use, uh, we have daily minimum staffing levels. Those slots that are uh, unfilled, we use overtime to fill. As we have increased our pool of employees, we've been able to decrease overtime on a one-to-one -one basis. Okay, so are you on target this uh, fiscal year for the same sort of level of overtime costs? 
Yes, yes. We're okay. trending the same way this year. So even though we're hearing from the controller that actually sometimes we save money by doing overtime because we're not hiring additional um, personnel, you're saying that you have a t hired additional personnel, so you have a less you have left, uh, less overtime cost. Right. We right. don't want to uh, have mandatory overtimes. Because we have this fixed mandatory daily staffing, we know exactly how many slots we have to fill every day. And we don't have the, the staff to fill all those, so we like to do the flux with the overtime. So when you, um, since you have this decrease in overtime, it's because you've had more people hired and coming on, do you see a different level of productivity, or are you seeing um, any effects health-wise? Uh, we should, we have seen better morale because we are, we try and avoid, we have an assignment office, we try and avoid uh, mandatory overtime requiring people to come in. We're, we're mostly using voluntary, aside from our EMS operations where we have a higher demand. So we've ha had to use some mandatory overtime in that area. Okay. Any questions for the fire department? Seeing none. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now the sheriff's department, I know that you've been working super hard on your overtime. And I know that you could probably give me a dissertation on overtime. <laughs> it's been sort of the bane of your job here because every, the lack of staffing, I think, has been an issue. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Crispin Hollings from CFO uh, Sheriff's Department. So um, in 2014-15, in including attrition savings, we had uh, 1,015 employees in our budget. Uh, in 17-18, we had 1,001 employees in our budget. So that's a decrease of uh, 1%. In the meantime, though, our workload has increased 13% um, roughly in that same time. These are um, uh, mandates or service requests um, we have, as you know, uh, roughly a, a fixed post um, staffing model, either for the jails or for our service requests, um, providing security services at places like here at City Hall. Um, so we have been filling that spot with overtime. We would uh, very much like to reduce our overtime. Department-wide, our overtime is about 20% uh, of total hours, but within, say, the DSA work group, Overtime is 23% of just total work hours. So if we take a look at a person's 20, 80 hour work, which includes vacation, holidays, et cetera, overtime makes up 17% if I compare it to that. Um, we actually were making some uh, progress with comp time. We, uh, the city established a cap, um, uh, one that the city interpreted uh, to be part of the MOU, uh, but that cap was lifted midway through this year, and I, um, comp time doubled in the, in the few pay periods following the lifting of that cap. I believe that cap is going to stay lifted. Um, with regard to uh, the exemption, actually, we have we have applied for exemptions every year. We just didn't do it in. 1718, it was an administrative error. I apologize for that, but we have applied for it in the past. Do you know um, how many you've applied for? I believe we've done it annually. I mean, I've, I went back and I looked for records when Michael was asking me for it for 1718. I thought I had found it, but it, it was actually the 1617 one that I found. And then beyond that, I found uh, 1516, 1415, but we did not apply in 1718. So your department, though, um, believes that it is a, the amount of overtime that you have is directly related to understaffing of FTEs in your department? Well, disconnect between staffing and the um, services that we're being requested to, to provide. Right. So you feel like there's been um, additional services that the Sheriff's Department has had to undertake? Definitely. I okay. mean, I think one really good example is uh, court-ordered pre-trial electronic monitoring, um, the, the court has uh, tripled the, the caseload for us there, and we don't have additional staffing for that, but we are managing that as ordered by the court. I think uh, your department, above all, um, a great concern about the overtime and the excess. 
hours that folks have to work, as we heard last year very clearly from workers that there was a lot of mandatory overtime, is that um, when your employees work overtime, they are also incarcerated. So they are in the jail setting, so it means as though um, it's not like a regular job where people can actually leave mm -hmm. and take a company car and go do whatever. It is, they are actually within the jail facility themselves. Yes, yeah, so, about, ha about half of our staff is in the jail facility. Yeah, and, and I think that does take a toll on folks, quite frankly. Yes, and, you, and about 10% about of that uh, overtime is mandatory overtime. Oh, 10%. So you have a staffing plan that you think is going to help address this? So we have been working with the city services auditor group in the controller's office. They've just released a report. Um, it's still in its confidential draft form, but um, it focuses on uh, key strategies that could help us reduce our heavy reliance on overtime, including uh, civilianizing a uh, number of positions within the department. So our, you know, we've been working with the mayor's office to civilianize um, some portion of what is recommended in the controller's report. But they, because it's still in its confidential form, the mayor's office hasn't seen it yet. Thank you very much. Supervisor Stephanie. How many positions do you have currently open that have not yet been filled? So actually, yes, I wanted to talk about that too. The, uh, uh, Michael was saying that we are fully staffed. We are fully staffed relative to our budget. In fact, we are overstaffed relative to our budget. Um, we are meant to have about uh, 100 um, people in attrition savings. We're down to 70 in attrition savings. So we are overstaffed relative to our budget, but we're still not at full staffing relative to uh, what we actually need. We're about, according to the controller's report, we're about 240 short. 240 deputy sheriffs short? Uh, to, well, to, 240 uh, less. We have 240 fewer people than what our workload uh, requires. You know, maybe about uh, 100, 140 of that could be reasonably done with overtime, but nonetheless, we need to bring on about 100 people or civilianize uh, about between civilianization or bringing, simply bringing on new people, trading new people for overtime hours. So it would be uh, a wash financially. Uh, we, need to, we need to bring new names into the roster. Are, there, are you having trouble bringing on additional people in, in uh, much like uh, many um, public safety agencies, uh, it's much harder to get people to come on now, which really is partly what makes civilianization uh, fairly attractive. I think, um, I mean, the job market is pretty tight, so even civilianization uh, will require a fair amount of effort, but it will be less than what it would uh, mean to bring on new people. But since uh, Sheriff Hennessy came on, after you know, about four years of no hiring, we've brought on 250 new people into the department. And are the um, new laws around gun violence restraining orders and Prop 63, are those um, contributing to overtime hours and the need of the expansion really of more services required? Yes, yes, it's just an increase in the um, levels of service required by or requested from, required requested from our department. Okay, thank you. Um, I so, think, oh, yes, President Yee. Um, I guess more bluntly, um, did you, it, for your proposed budget uh, for next year, will you have a uh, line item um, amount that could help train, uh, recruit, um, uh, expedite the, the uh, recruitment of new sheriffs, op officers, I guess? I believe um, when the budget finally is closed in the mayor's department at the end of the day today, it will have sufficient uh, funding to bring on a, uh, another academy class, which will, which will help us. I mean, that will, then at least we'll have the, the budget to bring on additional sworn people. It will also have um, some allowance for civilianization. Um, the report recommends 34. It'll be much lower than that, but it will be a start. 
And how many academy classes do you need? You know, ideally, we would bring on, um, uh, let's see, 75 people. This year, we brought on 60, and that has been a struggle to bring on 60. So, I mean, you know, 75 is a stretch goal, but that is what um, somewhere between 75 and 100 is really what we'd like to bring on so that we can replace essentially overtime FTEs with full-time FTEs at a net at a net cost of zero. So, um, except, can, you trans, can you translate between the 75 FTE and how many academy classes you need? Um, well, so we don't have our own academy, but we, um, uh, we contract with uh, primarily the academy up in Santa Rosa, and we can bring on as many as uh, 25 to 30 with each academy class. Um, the constraint has really been finding sufficient number of people who um, pass our background checks um, and all the other uh, pre-academy hurdles to, to get them into the academy and then actually to get them through the academy. So, so what you're saying is the budget, there's enough in the budget if you wanted to bring it up to 75 For next year, yes. For this year, we... We had some budget constraints, but for next year, we will be, I believe, at, I have yet to, to see the proposal, but I understand from my discussions with uh, the mayor's budget analyst who is assigned to the sheriff's department that we will have sufficient dollars next year. Okay, well, that's good to know. And, and when your, the sheriff's department budget comes before us again, uh, if I don't ask you that question, can you remind me to ask you that question? Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Allens. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. And lastly, do we have public health in the house? Afternoon, Supervisors. Jenny Louie, DPH Budget Director. Um, in terms of the vacancy, uh, the overtimes at DPH, they're really driven by vacancies that are really at the hospitals. Um, I believe Mr. Mitten was correct to sort of separate the two hospitals together because there's sort of two different stories going on there. Um, starting with San Francisco General, um, as you know, we opened our new facility in May of 2016. Um, and since then, we sort of, we did see that spike in overtime and it's since leveled off. Um, what we saw were just increased ED volumes as well as increased patient census. And so when we have increased patient ED volumes and increased patient census, we have to staff to make sure that we're meeting the patient's needs accordingly, um, according to mandated staffing ratios. Um, the volumes have leveled off, um, as you'll see, and it's through a few different strategies that we've implemented uh, by reducing ED volumes um, through the opening of our new urgent care center, which allows us to divert cases where, um, which might not require the level of an ED, and they will go over to urgent care as a few as other um, triage um, strategies uh, within the emergency department. Um, for the inpatient census at San Francisco General, we've been looking a lot at patient flow, and so sort of looking at sort of the back door of getting people outside of, um, out of the hospitals and sort of improving the patient flow um, to try to um, maintain the census and not have it um, uh, increase anymore. Um, at Laguna Honda Hospital, um, its patient census has actually been fairly stable over the last several years. Um, but what we were seeing over the last couple of years was an increased need uh, for one-on-one -on -one coaches for some of our patients. So these patients um, were presenting with um, issues um, that, was, that required beyond the regular um, safety, staffing safety um, um, required additional safety needs that required us to increase staffing to have actually one-on-one -on -one coach um, to, uh, to observe them. And so some of the things that we were seeing was like um, um, intrusive behavior, um, aggressive behavior, um, risk for falls, um, the need for additional support because perhaps they can't feed or toilet themselves. Um, so the, for, um, for clinical reasons, they were determined that it was best to actually have a one-on-one -on -one coach um, with them. And so that is beyond our existing current staffing ratios. Um, 
And so to ensure that we are meeting the patient safety and quality, um, they incurred overtime to address, um, to ensure that we're meeting their needs. Um, in fiscal year 18-19, um, we did propose an initiative to adjust our budget to make sure that we're staffing more accordingly. Um, it is a little bit unpredictable because <laughs> we won't know exactly, you know, who is going to be coming in through Laguna Honda, um, but that's the strategy that we've used to date. Any questions, colleagues? Um, but for San Francisco General, is there a mandatory overtime? Um, there is. Um, I don't believe that there is. No. Um, if you give me one moment. For example, nurses. I mean, is there a mandatory overtime? Hi, yes, our, I'm Karen Hill, um, Hi, Director Karen. of Staffing. But our RNs, yes, have mandatory overtime, but it's based on consensus. The patients, you know, the, if there's um, higher uh, consensus in the patients coming into ED, so if they may be required to work overtime. So why aren't we hiring more nurses? Because I'm hearing that we're hiring a lot of nurses per diem, but we're not hiring full-time nurses as part of our whole system. So we are hiring um, RNs, but we do have um, areas like critical care and ED where we have um, recruitment challenges. Um, the market doesn't, you know, it, where each, all the hospitals are actually grabbing at the same applicant pool. So we have a shortage in those specialty areas like critical care and ED, which is where a lot of our um, vacancies are. And so we have recruitment challenges, which is why we have um, a lot of the vacancies. We also have, you know, more people that will come in and take the per diem because they're already working in another hospital. Um, and so we try to recruit by hiring per diems to get them an opportunity to see how they like a trauma center and then in hopes to get them to transition into a permanent position. And how many of those have transitioned to permanent positions? Well, we have... Um, in, in most of the hiring that we do, we hire in the uh, med surge. So we hire up in the med surge and we train them in the specialty areas. And then when those training programs open, we're able to hire our per diems um, from the med surge into the training program. And each training program is, carries about six to eight um, trainees per program. And those are actually every about six months, so twice a year we have training programs in those specialties. And then per diem, so they go into a per diem program and then they transition to our regular system? Well, they, go in, they start off as per diem and then they, they train in the areas of their specialty of interest. And then we try to get them to go into the areas where we have recruitment challenges, mm -hmm. like critical care and ED, but it takes more training and more experience that's required to go into those training programs. So how successful are we transitioning these people from per diem positions into permanent positions? I feel we, we can improve more, um, but again, we have um, a shortage of when we, we have um, preceptors to train, so we can increase our training program in larger amount than the six to eight that we have every six months, because it takes uh, you know, a one-on-one -on -one preceptor to train Sure. So from the six to eight that you train every six months, how many you transfer from per diem to permanent Well, the positions? training program is they're benefited. So those are tr actually training positions. So when they go from per diem into a training program, they're actually RNs. They go from a per diem to a 2320 training, trainee. And then they become permanent nurses in our system. The training program is a permanent. So they permanent. actually have to resign from their uh, per diem in order to go into the training program, and then they have to successfully pass probation if they want dual appointments. And then you hope to place them in these critical care and ED positions. Yeah, that's where we have the... That's the, where you have your most mandatory yes. overtime. Okay. Um, any questions? So we've, um, I think that we've seen also here that there's been an increase in your overtime. Sorry, can you repeat An that? increase in your overtime, and is this particularly because of the critical care and ED That shortage? and then the FMLA plans, I mean, in the planned and unplanned absences, you know, it's an increase in that as well. And um, we, while we try to manage our discretionary leaves, but the FMLA, um, the state and federal required leaves, we can't control. So um, 
we have to manage them. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions for DPH? Seeing none, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, excuse me, but may I ask some questions of the controller's office, just for an explanation of actually this last chart here. So the last chart I am seeing, uh, not, not the one that says your name, Mr. Mitten, but the one the real one. That, the, the maximum allowed annual overtime. So tell me what I'm looking at. I see general services agency, that's the city administrator, employees above default limit. Those are 15 employees that have worked over 25% of their regularly scheduled hours. Is that Cor correct? That's correct. The employees exempt? Those that means are zero exempted through DHR. None, yeah, none exempted through DHR. Uh, they did not even request. They did not even request. Yeah. So the average overtime as percentage of regular hours, are you telling me that 30% of these individuals' hours or the, de the whole department's hours? These individuals, so of the individuals who exceeded the 25%, on average, they had 30% overtime relative to their regular hours. And okay. I'll just point out, one of the reasons we report this is you can look at police, they're at 27%. Mm -hmm. What that means is they may have had the 20 people exceed, but they didn't exceed it by very much because they were only 27%, as opposed to sheriffs where uh, they exceeded it by a lot. Yeah. Um, you know these percentages, yeah, when I look at them, actually, um, if we, so what we can really look at this is that it's really adding 30% more hours onto the workload. Would you interpret as that? Uh, relative to what they're allowed to work, the 520 hours in a year, yeah. it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's maybe not that much, uh, an extra 5%, going from 25 to 30%. I'm bad at math on the fly, but maybe that's yeah, 100 I'm hours, super hours. bad at math. I, yeah. So, um, okay. So when I look at this chart, um, what is it telling me? Like, what are you, give me an analysis of what this chart is telling us there today. I think it's telling you that a, there's a lot of people who are working a lot of overtime. Um, we probably didn't need the chart to tell us that, but we got the chart anyway. Uh, and without permission. And that's the second thing, is without permission. Exactly. And so we're seeing a lot of people working a lot of overtime. And we're seeing a lot of people working that overtime without um, authorization, exemptions. Correct. So we're seeing perhaps that all these people are working overtime to match, actually make ends meet. A lot of, because some of it is mandatory. I'm hearing a lot of it is voluntary. Would that be your assumption? That would be an assumption. That's not something I've studied. Thank you very much. Supervisor Stephanie. In looking at this chart, I'm just wondering, um, I note that the library is the highest at 46%, and I'm wondering why. But there's only two of them. There's only two. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't specifically look, but since there's only two, it's, it feels oh, like there's okay. just randomness there. See, I'm bad at math as well. It's just a person stacking yeah. the books. Um, yeah, but I, I would say MTA is a little, I mean, 584 employees, that's huge. Um, it would be interesting to see what that breakdown is of employees and what classifications they are, actually. Uh, I don't have it here. No. And to, um, and to know how these numbers relate to the overall number of employees in those departments, right? Yes. As in like a thousand city, how many city employees are there total? 25,000, something like that? 30,000. 30,000. Um, but I imagine... I mean, I imagine sheriff is actually a pretty. <laughs> I would like to speak. He has been studying overtime. He's an expert in overtime. So poor he Crispin. Could... Yeah, poor Crispin. But two hundred eight. Two hundred eight seems large for a sh for the sheriff's department. It, it, we we have huge amounts of overtime, and I am grateful for all of these people who want to work overtime yeah. because there are a lot of people who have kids, families who don't want to be working overtime on Christmas Day. And if one of these people who works a lot of overtime wants to do it, um, 
I think more power to them. Right. Thank goodness that they are there. Um, really, we do need to reduce overtime. We need to uh, work into the budget a way to like um, stuff more people into our training pipeline so that we can replace overtime hours with full-time hours. But in the meantime, it is really, it's a mixed bag, but it is really helpful to have people who like to work a lot of overtime. Um, and again, I apologize that we didn't apply for a, uh, an exemption in 1718, but we do have a very good record of applying for exemptions. Sure. I, I think what doesn't bother me is m the exemptions don't bother me as much as the human toll that it that it takes on a person to be working so much overtime. Mm -hmm. I mean, I get it that in San Francisco we have a really high cost of living, mm -hmm. and the idea that we have these uh, we have volunteers that are willing to go out their holidays with their families and family time in order to survive here in the San Francisco or feed their children a, a livelihood. I think it's um, somewhat disturbing. I actually don't see this as being um, somewhat sustainable for even though I know that it's been mentioned that this is not really a budgetary issue because actually we are saving money on overtime work so we're not hiring full-time employees. I actually think there is a toll. There is something else that we are also um, missing and I think that is the human element here is that we want to retain our employees we want them to be as healthy as possible and I think we have responsibility as an employer to um, actually assist them in being as healthy as they can be I mean while they're serving um, the city and county of San Francisco but also while they're with their families too and I think we have a moral responsibility to try to have a workforce that has a good morale, that actually likes to come to work and looks forward to work every day, and also feels as though they're being supported emotionally, mentally, and also physically in our work environments. And when we have this level of mandatory overtime where that people have to work these overtime hours, I just think it is not sustainable for a human being, but quite frankly, for even having a personal relationship or a family life. So, um, but thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank I know you. you've worked really hard in the overtime. We always kind of um, jack you up over it. And so thanks for being able to answer all those questions. Um, co colleagues, any comments, questions anymore? I want to thank the controller and every department that was here. I think that we have a somewhat of a deeper understanding about the overtime level and the overtime needs. And thank you, Mr. Controller. Thank you, Mr. Minton, for coming today and giving our report. And thank you to all the departments for answering our questions and for giving us um, a deeper understanding and also seeing, I guess, revealing sort of what we as legislators may need to be doing. Um, I would like to take public comment on this now. Are there any members of the public that would like to comment on the budget impact of overtime spending? Seeing none, public comment is now closed. I'd like to um, make a motion to file this item, please. Could I have a second? Second it by Supervisor Mandelman, if you can take that without objection. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, can you please call item number three?